On the wintry night of January 30th, 1945, prison guards and personnel rushed outside the Cabanatuan POW camp in the Philippines. Their eyes fixed on an Allied aircraft that seemed to have lapped straight from the pages of a science fiction novel. The P-61 Black Widow presented a sleek and foreboding shape, usually shrouded in the cloak of night. Her twin tails soared skyward like the outstretched wings of a predatory hawk. But on this night, the unique fighter was utterly exposed and fighting to stay in the air. The night hunter circled erratically, descending uncontrollably as her engine sputtered and backfired with a thundering howl. Witnessing one of America's most classified and imposing warplanes in a death spiral was a spectacle the Japanese guards couldn't resist. The Black Widow executed a wing waggle, barely skimmed over the tree-laden ridgeline, clearing it by 30 feet before vanishing over the horizon. The Japanese, spellbound, awaited the explosion. But this disaster of American aviation was not real. It was a brilliantly executed ruse to divert the guards' attention. It bought precious time for the combined might of the United States Army Rangers, Alamo Scouts and Filipino guerrillas to stealthily traverse the open ground surrounding the camp and launch a bold rescue of the 500 Allied POWs languishing inside. As the Japanese guards awaited the mythical P-61 to explode over the horizon, they were blissfully unaware of the shocking turn of events that awaited them. In the dead of night, as Luftwaffe bombers relentlessly hammered London during World War II, during the harrowing blitz, an urgent call echoed across the Atlantic. The Allies needed a warplane to own the night skies and defend their homes against the German raids, and this was the birth cry of the P-61 Black Widow, a fighter conceived in desperation and born of necessity. The British Purchasing Commission, casting a critical eye over US aircraft, demanded a night fighter with the stamina for an eight-hour vigil in the sky, equipped with early heavy airborne interception radar units and bristling with a lethal array of multiple gun turrets. Jack Northrup, a visionary in the aviation world, knew these demands called for an unprecedented machine, a large multi-engine aircraft. He rolled up his sleeves and dove into the design, driven by the British's dire needs. In November 1940, the P-61 Black Widow project began. It was designed as a sleek aircraft with a mysterious look to it. One could clearly picture it lurking in the night, claiming its victims before they knew they were being hit. It was also a rather large aircraft for a fighter jet, 50 feet long and with a wingspan of 66 feet. Simultaneously, the US Army Air Corps echoed the British plea. General Emmons, carrying the weight of the British night fighter requirements, brought them stateside. The Emmons board, in a no-nonsense approach, laid out the ground rules, underlining the massive challenges posed by the hulking heavy airborne interception radar and the marathon loiter times. They put their chips on a twin-engine design, eyeing powerhouses like the Pratt and Whitney Double Wasp and the Duplex Cyclone. Northrop's initial blueprint was a lengthy fuselage gondola straddling twin-engine nacelles and tail booms, powered by the roaring Pratt and Whitney R2810 Double Wasp radial engines. This night interceptor was to be manned by a three airmen crew. The Black Widow's lethal bite could rival any enemy. I carried 4.20 mm Hispano M2 cannons in the lower fuselage and 4.50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns in the dorsal turret. Another stealthy innovation was a new glossy black paint instead of the usual olive green and gray paint in the metal armor. Night flight tests in Florida in October 1943 pitted both schemes against each other. The black model was undetected in 80% of flights through searchlight beams. Crafting the P-61 was a Herculean task, wrestling with her massive frame and hefty weight for a fighter, melding together the radar and armament systems was like taming a wild beast. This increased the development times again and again, even as the British continued to fight against the German night raids. It took Northrop engineers over a year and a half to fix developmental delays and revisions, all while the Army Air Forces were desperate to start training night pilots. They had no problem getting the crews of volunteers for the training. Redesign demands during the pre-production phase took Northrop two critical wartime years. Despite the massive delays, the Black Widow's modification phases turned it into a platform for innovation. Her imposing size and twin-tail boom design were a bold leap unprecedented in the world of fighter aircraft. The P-61 Black Widow became America's first purpose-built night predator. Despite her daunting size, the P-61 was surprisingly nimble in a dogfight, a revelation that bolstered the confidence of her pilots. 
The P-61's official public debut was quite dramatic. In January 1944, a P-61 performed a flyover of the Los Angeles Coliseum filled with 75,000 spectators as part of an Army-Navy show. The aircraft's incredible aesthetics and design were mesmerizing and unlike anything seen by the public so far. One of the most striking features of the P-61 was its twin-boom design. This rare configuration where the fuselage ends in two separate tail booms was a visual departure from the conventional single fuselage aircraft. Each boom supported a vertical stabilizer and rudder, framing the horizontal stabilizer and central nacelle containing the cockpit and weaponry. Expectators could hardly believe how massive the aircraft was for a fighter aircraft, with a length of 45.5 feet and a wingspan of 66 feet. The aircraft's full load weight was a substantial 22,600 pounds, further emphasizing its daunting stature. As it entered service in the final months of World War II, the Black Widow's combination of size, power, advanced technology and distinctive design made it an awe-inspiring sight in the skies. The first squadron to fly the Black Widow in Europe was the 422nd Night Fighter Squadron on May 23, 1944. Almost a month later, the 425th Squadron received their widows. However, both of them received the jet too late to participate in the D-Day invasion on June 6. The Black Widow's first real mission was against the feared German V-1 buzz bomb. In the Mediterranean, the 414th Squadron received its P-61 in December. They worked together with the 422nd Squadron in the Battle of the Bulge, the last major attack campaign against the Allies on the Western Front during World War II. During this battle, the P-61's obsolescence first became apparent. The delays and hurdles in the lengthy development phase finally came back to haunt them. Lieutenant Van Nijswender was piloting his Daisy May Black Widow when an encounter with a Messerschmitt 419 led to a pursuit across the woods. Van Nijswender attempted to attack and follow its enemy by chasing it at full throttle. But by the time the Black Widow caught up, the Mi-410 pulled away at 400 miles per hour, making the P-61 seem so sluggish it looked like time was standing still. The 422nd and 425th squadrons were also critically short of spare parts by the end of 1944. Being a smaller company, Northrop couldn't keep up with the demand, and the issue was never corrected. The squadrons had to make do with whatever equipment they had on hand, even adapting their own makeshift parts in order to keep their revolutionary birds in the sky. The problems continued to mount in the field, airflow issues from her top turret and grappling with spare part shortages in European squadrons. She was a versatile war machine, adept in both night patrols and ground assaults, but she was no match for the modern German fighter that now roamed free across Europe. Most operational P-61S ended up being sent to the Pacific, after Guadalcanal was secured in late 1942, the American stronghold urgently needed nighttime protection from Japanese bases in the surrounding areas. But the Black Widows weren't ready yet, so the Americans adapted B-25S, P-40S, P-38S and P-70S as night fighters. Finally, in May 1944, the Black Widows were ready to fight in the Pacific. The first to receive a P-61 was the 6th Squadron. They were the only night fighting squadron until the 418th and 419th squadrons also began working with Black Widows. A Lieutenant Dale Haberman and his radio operator, Lieutenant Ray Mooney, manned an early model P-61A christened Moon Happy within the ranks of the 6th Night Fighter Squadron. On the fateful night of June 30th, 1944, Shortly after the squadron's operational debut on Saipan, they locked horns with a Mitsubishi G 4M2 Betty bomber flanked by a Japanese escort, likely a Mitsubishi A6M50. This encounter gained an edge of suspense as the intercom chatter between Haberman and Mooney was relayed back to base. Amidst a routine patrol, a jolt of adrenaline hit when base control reported an unidentified aircraft hurtling towards Lieutenant Haberman's P-61. Oblivious to the ambush lying in wait, the adversary's bomber was squarely in the Black Widow's sights. Haberman, lying in wait beneath the enemy's flight path, throttled up for a stomach-churning 180-degree turn, positioning behind the bomber now barreling towards Saipan's airfields. Drawing near the radar blip, Lieutenant Mooney cautioned Haberman to ease off the throttle as the singular target split into two. 
The bomber now accompanied by a Japanese fighter. Ascending to 17,000 feet, the enemy remained unaware of the night predator at their six. When the distance shrunk to a mere 700 feet, Mooney cued Haberman to unleash hell. The P-61's 420 Enlem cannons roared to life, unleashing a tempest of fire upon the ill-fated Betty. Engulfed in flames, it nosedived into the ocean. Mooney's sharp call echoed through the tense airwaves. Quote, Look out, Hap! There's a Jap fighter on our tail. Deathly silence ensued, broken only by the enemy's errant shots. Alerted, Haberman tilted his port wing downward, diving towards the ocean in a desperate evasion Rudders working overtime to shake the pursuer. At a mere 1,200 feet above sea level, Haberman leveled Moonhappy, still at breakneck speed, and veered sharply, hoping to reacquire the enemy on radar. But the night swallowed the fighter whole. It was a tactical play. The Betty likely served as the fighter's vanguard, explaining its tight formation and singular radar signature. The 418th Squadron, based at Moratai, Halmaheras, Netherlands, East Indies, operated the top-scored Black Widow. The squadron had 18 successful attacks and was able to destroy three Kawasaki Ki-61S in just one night. At the controls of the aptly named Hard to Get was Captain Kenneth Schreiber, flanked by Radar Specialist First Lieutenant Bonnie Rux of the 547th Night Fighter Squadron. This pair was tasked with an unconventional mission to execute a low-altitude flyby over the prison camp creating a diversion that would enable a coalition of United States Army Rangers, Alamo Scouts and Filipino guerrillas to stealthily navigate the perilous terrain surrounding the camp. Following the capitulation of tens of thousands of US troops during the Battle of Bataan, many were incarcerated in the Cabanatuan prison camp after the harrowing Bataan death march. The Japanese, anticipating an American offensive, transferred most prisoners, leaving just over 500 American and other Allied POWs and civilians in the worst conditions imaginable. They endured disease, torture and malnourishment, with the looming fear of execution before General Douglas MacArthur's return to Luzon with American forces. In late January 1945, a daring plan was hatched by 6th Army leaders and Filipino guerrillas to rescue the prisoners. A formidable force of over 100 rangers and scouts, alongside 200 guerrillas, embarked on a 30-mile incursion behind enemy lines to reach the camp. The unprecedented idea of deploying a warplane to distract the camp guards was initially met with skepticism, particularly by Ranger Commander Captain Robert Prince, who worried that the spectacle might alert the Japanese to impending Allied action. A crucial 45 minutes before the assault, Schreiber and Rux roared over the camp, brilliantly simulating a plane in dire straits, teetering on the brink of destruction. The Japanese, utterly deceived, watched intently as the P-61 performed a perilous dance of survival, engines sputtering and misfiring explosively, a result of Schreiber's expert manipulation of the ignition, intermittently cutting and reigniting power. The aircraft's wings waggled defiantly as they skimmed the tree-laden ridgeline, a mere 30 feet from catastrophe, only to soar upwards and dive for another heart-stopping pass. Eventually, they disappeared over the horizon, leaving the Japanese spellbound, their ears tuned for the anticipated clash of destruction. This daring aerial charade left the Japanese completely oblivious to the imminent raid on Cabanatuan. Against staggering odds, Schreiber, Rux and their versatile P-61 Black Widow accomplished the impossible. Even Captain Prince had to concede, admitting, quote, The idea of an aerial decoy was a little unusual and honestly I didn't think it would work, not in a million years, but the pilot's maneuvers were so skillful and deceptive that the diversion was complete. I don't know where we would have been without it. As the P-61 Black Widow buzzed the camp, Lieutenant Carlos Tombo and his guerrillas, bolstered by a handful of rangers, executed a crucial maneuver, severing the camp's telephone lines, effectively isolating it from the substantial Japanese force in Cabanatuan. In the initial 15 seconds of gunfire, the camp's guard towers and pillboxes were systematically decimated. Sergeant Ted Richardson bravely rushed to blast the padlock off the main gate with his .45 pistol. The rangers at the gate swiftly brought the guard barracks and officer quarters under a hail of bullets, while their comrades at the rear neutralized the enemy near the prisoners' huts, setting the stage for the evacuation. 
A bazooka team from F Company charged up the main road towards a tin shack, identified by the scouts as housing enemy tanks. Despite attempts by Japanese soldiers to flee in two trucks, the team efficiently destroyed both the vehicles and the shack. Initially, the POWs mistook the gunfire as the onset of a Japanese massacre. Descriptions of the attack likened it to a chaotic symphony of, quote, whistling slugs, Roman candles, and flaming meteors. Prisoners scrambled for cover in shacks, latrines, and irrigation ditches. Complications arose when the rangers called out to the POWs for rescue. Many, paralyzed by fear and weakened by malnourishment, suspected a Japanese ruse and remained hidden. This unforeseen challenge necessitated that the rescuers forcefully extract many POWs from their hideouts amidst the fierce firefight. By 8.15 p.m., the camp was liberated from Japanese control. The rangers, along with the debilitated POWs, were safely evacuated using carabao carts, thoughtfully organized by Pahota. The scouts remained vigilant, monitoring for enemy movements. This mission, initially deemed an impossible rescue, turned into a monumental success, thanks largely to the exceptional capabilities of a single P-61 Black Widow and its valiant crew. What transpired with this particular Black Widow during the twilight hours of World War II defies belief. It notched the final two aerial victories of the conflict, one on the ultimate night of the war and another astonishingly 24 hours after the official cessation of hostilities, each achieved without discharging a single round. On the eve of August 14th, 1945, Lady in the Dark was under the command of a different crew. In a tense, low-altitude pursuit, the American crew kept pushing an enemy warplane into increasingly desperate maneuvers as the night fighter closed the space between the two birds. In a lethal miscalculation, the Japanese pilots dove too close to the water as they fought to lose the American hunter. The Japanese warplanes plunged into the sea, erupting in flames, yet not a shot was fired by the Black Widow. Although the war drew to a close at midnight, the threat of nocturnal kamikaze strikes against American bases lingered, keeping the P-61S vigilantly on alert. The subsequent evening, Captain Kendall embarked on what seemed a routine sortie at 7.10 p.m. Within the hour, a potential adversary, a bogey, was reported approaching at 4,500 feet. The chase unfolded swiftly, with Kendall's radar observer detecting window, a deceptive tactic involving the release of foil strips to disrupt radar tracking. The adversary was executing sharp maneuvers, clearly aware of the pursuit. Kendall recounted the pursuit's intensity, quote, getting close enough for a positive identification proved to be difficult. He was taking violent evasive action and dropping window, which were bundles of tinsel-like strips of aluminum foil designed to confuse our radar. This guy knew we were behind him, but I have no idea how he knew. My RO, Lieutenant Shearer, was talking me in closer to about 800 feet when all of a sudden the left side pilot's window popped open and the rush of air drowned out the communications with him. Down this low at such a high speed and not being able to understand my observer was very unhealthy. He continued, quote, I had to back off, secure the window and then get back in touch with him. In the meantime, I lost contact with the bogey, but quickly picked him up again and was able to close on his tail again despite his defensive moves. I had one eye on my target and one eye on my altimeter. Suddenly, the window popped open again and once again I closed it, and as I picked him up for a third time, the same thing happened again. Regardless, I went after him for a fourth time, and control gave me permission to shoot him down, even though we didn't have a positive identification. As Kendall re-engaged, the bogey vanished from the radar, with no further window detected. Ground witnesses later reported the intruder's crash, its wreckage strewn across a broad area. The aircraft was identified as a Nakajima Kai, 44 Tojo fighter, likely on a malevolent mission. Lady in the Dark had thwarted its potential objective, assuming it had one. This encounter, not recorded as an official kill due to the war's conclusion, stands as a testament to a Black Widow's final World War II victories, achieved without firing a single shot. By the war's end, 941 P-61S had rolled off the line, with their units claiming a tally of 109 enemy aircraft shot down. Post-war, she stepped back from the limelight and was replaced by newcomers like the F-82 twin Mustang. Today, a handful of P-61S stand as silent sentinels in museums, testaments to a pivotal chapter in the saga of military aviation. 
Yet, with a limited fleet of operational Black Widows, insufficient parts for repairs, and a narrow window of just six months before the war's end, the legacy of this unique and powerful warplane has been largely overshadowed by more iconic and consequential fighters of the era. Despite these challenges, the P-61's contributions were significant, particularly in the Pacific. Its engagement in night combat and interception missions underscored its potential in a specialized role. However, the broader narrative of World War II aviation has tended to favor aircraft that had a more sustained and widespread impact throughout the war. Northrop's engineers made concerted efforts to rectify the P-61's shortcomings. They revamped the airborne intercept radar, enhancing the performance of its remote-controlled turret. Despite adding turbochargers aimed at boosting speed, the Black Widow still lagged in velocity compared to its contemporaries. In the European theater, the British Mosquito MKE-7 emerged as a more viable combatant, gradually sidelining the Black Widow to reserve status, where its role shifted primarily to a training aircraft. Still, the Black Widow left its mark in every theater of World War II, tallying an impressive combat record with the destruction of 127 enemy aircraft and 18 German V-1 buzz bombs. Post-war, the Black Widow was enlisted in Operation Thunderstorm, a joint venture led by four US government agencies, the Army Air Force, the Navy, the Weather Bureau, and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the precursor to NASA. This project focused on thunderstorm research to safeguard military and civilian aircraft against such hazardous conditions. Many breakthroughs and theories from this study became foundational in our current understanding of thunderstorms and associated meteorological phenomena. The Black Widow was officially retired from service in 1954. Despite its late entry into World War II, the P-61 fought valiantly until its conclusion. The aircraft also demonstrated the invaluable role of airborne intercept radar. This technology would become a standard feature in US warplanes, underscoring the Black Widow's enduring legacy in aerial warfare and military aviation.